Yeah, hello to everyone and thank you for joining our uh, Lightning Talks webinar today on Analytics for Libraries, Trends, Tools and Uses, uh, hosted by the QLOC ICT Working Party. So my name is Jessie Donaghy and I'm the Digital Services Librarian at Bond University and also the current convener for the QLOC ICT Working Party. So since some of you attending the webinar today won't be familiar with QLOC, I thought I'd give you a quick uh, overview. So QLOC is a collaborative organisation which provides a framework for information exchange, good practice development and cooperative activities. QLOC supports the promotion of common interests relating to the teaching, learning and research needs of our member institutions. The ICT Working Party is just one of five working parties in addition to two practitioner groups and uh, working party members meet <clears throat> about three times a year and often hold professional development events for members to attend. And this year, the ICT Working Party decided to hold a webinar on the topic of analytics. And due to the popularity of the topic, we decided to open registrations up to outside of QLOC. So we have uh, five presenters today from our member institutions presenting on case studies of how analytics have been used in their libraries. And we're also very lucky to have Aaron Tay opening up the webinar and I can see he's connected now. Uh, so Aaron is the manager of library analytics and research librarian at Singapore Management University. And Aaron also writes for his blog, uh, Musings About Librarianship, where he has covered analytics in many of his posts. So before I hand over to Aaron, I will mention that we will take questions at the end of each of our presentations. Uh, but please use the chat to submit your question as we'll be keeping everyone muted throughout the webinar. All right, so I think we're ready to go, Aaron. I can um, stop sharing my screen and I'll hand over to you. Uh, hello. hello, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, let me share the screen. Is my screen showing? Is my slides showing? Hello, can you guys see my slides? No? Yes, sorry, Aaron, we can see. Okay, sure. Okay, uh, so um, very good morning to all of you. Uh, thank you, Jesse, for inviting me to the QLOG uh, webinar. Uh, it's my pleasure to talk about uh, library analytics, the trends that I see. And uh, I'm also looking forward to see uh, uh, the, the talks by the other presenters. Okay, so um, what do I see coming in uh, library analytics, in the field of library analytics? Uh, first thing I see, there's uh, increasing uh, analytics capabilities in libraries. I see um, the fact that many libraries are now doing a lot more with electronic resource usage beyond just counter stats, and we're doing a lot to measure more than just physical footfall. Uh, of course, there's a whole area of interest in terms of analytics to show value. And lastly, there's increasing interest in using predictive analytics and learning analytics. So I'll go into them uh, one by one. Okay. So um, as you guys already know, uh, in recent years, there's been interest outside of libraries in data science, in machine learning. And this has resulted in a set of general tools that are easy to use. For example, Tableau, Power BI, Click. These are tools that are, are almost a point uh, what you see and what you get in terms of visualization software. So they've been used uh, by librarians as well. So for example, I think one of the talks after me will talk about how they're using Tableau uh, to connect to Alma Analytics using uh, web connectors. So uh, this, this area will continue to improve and the uh, barrier to entry to doing good analytics will reduce over time. So. Uh, uh, other examples are things like OpenRefine, which many librarians are now more and more familiar, which they use this to clean data. Uh, of course, on the more cutting edge and more advanced side, there are tools that are open source like RapidMiner that allow you to do machine learning, and R, which is basically an overall programming language for data cleaning, machine learning, and various data cleaning tasks, uh, data tasks. Um, the other thing I see in uh, university libraries is that there's a parallel development towards um, an interest in data research management. So many academic library, uh, libraries are pushing towards data research management and, uh, uh, and um, there's interest in also learning how to manage data, how to clean data, how to manipulate data and how to visualize data. So uh, there are many uh, movements like the library data carpentry movement 
And uh, in my own institution, we have started baby steps to do uh, uh, holding bite-sized programs on uh, data, uh, data management uh, classes. So for example, we have classes on data visualization using Tableau, uh, data cleaning using Open, Open Refine, and so on. And we find that the demand for such classes is much higher than the demand for, say, uh, reference or for searching for articles. So this is the area that I think uh, academic libraries will be moving towards. Uh, um, and this, of course, will benefit the use, uh, benefit library analytics as well, as more and more librarians get familiar with uh, data cleaning and data analytics uh, skills. Uh, the other area, of course, in the past few years was the improvement in our library and, uh, for analytics capabilities when it comes to things like uh, our, uh, in, uh, our library management systems. So I saw this tweet, uh, Gene Tolman is the CEO of Innovative. So he was saying that uh, last year, he was saying that uh, the library systems, basically the library management systems are eight to 10 years behind when it comes to analytics. Uh, this is of course true. Uh, if you use systems like Millennium, uh, you will realize that it's almost impossible to get the data stats you want. Of course, the new breed of library management systems or what Marshall Breeding calls the library platform, uh, library services platforms, things like Sierra, things like uh, Alma, which I believe most people here are familiar with, have analytics baked in. So uh, there'll, be a, there'll be talks later about Alma Analytics, so I won't talk more about this. But the only thing I'll say is that I was attending a webinar uh, a couple of days ago, and I was very excited when I saw that uh, there's this idea of doing benchmarking in Alma Analytics, so that you can not just visualize your counter stats, but you can actually also benchmark against other libraries. So there seems to be a move towards benchmarking in library analytics. So a couple of days ago, Itika also uh, announced a project where they were trying to understand and study library acquisition patterns. Uh, the interesting thing about this is that they're leveraging uh, library management systems like Alma and WorldShare to do this benchmarking. So benchmarking seems to be a big thing in library, library analytics these days. Um, the other thing I see is there's a rise of third party uh, services that want to provide analytics capabilities to libraries. Basically, uh, you can kind of outsource your some of your analytics workload to them. So there are, there are services like the Journal Usage Statistical Portal. So this is basically, in the past, was basically mostly UK libraries, but now I see non-UK libraries joining as well. So they will help you manage your sushi and your counter stats and you also get the advantage of being able to benchmark against other libraries that are on the system. Uh, the other thing that I saw is rate link for libraries. Again, uh, this service I haven't tried before, but I look at their website, they're basically again offering to uh, manage for you your sushi and, and give you nice dashboards and nice graphs and so on of your counter stats. So uh, the third service that I find interesting recently is uh, OneScience. So OneScience is this organization that is uh, well known for their capability in terms of uh, assessing the state of open access. So they have crawlers that go all, all around the web to, to, to calculate the amount of open access available. So uh, fairly recently, they actually uh, demoed to me this service they have called OA Finder, OA Figure, and OA Folder. Uh, basically, OA Figure and OA Folder, which I think is more of, of more interest, basically what they do is that uh, they will actually give you, uh, you can give them, you will give them data, you can give them a list of journals, and they will be able to pull out uh, data on your behalf in terms of counter stats. And the part that's a bit unique is that they will be able to tell you how many percent of each journal is actually um, open access to aid decision making in terms of subscriptions. So they have a special element there in terms of their open access capabilities. They, could, they also can benchmark your library or ra rather your institution in terms of how open your, uh, your, your researchers are compared to other institutions. Uh, they can calculate citation advantage for your researchers in terms of open access and so on. So this is an interesting development, I think, where they bring in open access uh, analytics as well. Uh, the other type of company that's working on analytics would be companies like Mendeley or fix share. So what they do is that they provide a free basic service uh, and most of our researchers will go on there because the basic services are very generous. And after that, once there are enough people in the service, they will actually um, offer the library or the institution uh, a service and say that, you know, if you pay us a certain sum every month, uh, your researchers will get more access, uh, more, more storage space or more whatever features they get. But on top of that, you gain analytics. 
So in the case of uh, Mendeley, they will tell you, like for example, which journals are in your researchers' uh, uh, reference libraries. So all these services are being built around analytics, and I, I see in the coming years more and more such services will emerge. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, more beyond counter stats. Uh, I know many librarians here are very familiar with counter stats and they're also very familiar with how uh, difficult it is to handle counter stats. Uh, many databases that we have that we want to measure do not actually are not actually counter compliant and you know uh, and sushi collectors tend to break and so on. So one of the obvious ideas is to actually go to uh, go directly to the source, go to the easy proxy logs and see what we can actually pull up from easy proxy logs. Uh, Using easy proxy logs to measure usage is easy if you care about sessions only. But when you want to find out about downloads, it's a lot more tricky because you need to be able to create filters or passes to recognize uh, lines that refers to downloads. So uh, one of the interesting projects that I recently looked at is EasyPass. So EasyPass is this open source project. Uh, I believe it was initially started by a French consortium of institutions. Uh, I won't butcher the name because I can't pronounce it. Uh, but basically what they do is that uh, they have this system which is constantly updated with filters that uh, recognize uh, downloads for different platforms. So uh, you can actually, you can actually uh, there's a demo version that you can use online where you can actually feed, feed it your easy proxy logs and then it will pass out all the data that it can recognize from your logs. Uh, that of course is only a demo version. You are highly recommended to download a local version, install it, and then run uh, your easy proxy logs through there. Uh, I've tried it, tried it. Uh, it's not perfect. It doesn't recognize uh, all the databases that I want. For example, it's not that good at law databases, uh, but it, 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 it is an interesting development that, uh, that, uh, that uh, this library is actually going beyond just using counter stats. Uh, the other thing that I looked at recently was remote access. So, um, this is actually a easy proxy competitor. So when I looked at their capabilities, they were basically easy proxy, uh, the same features that you're used to, but they have analytics baked into the system. Actually give you measurements like uh, number, uh, the, the PDFs that were downloaded. They could tell you the amount of data downloaded and of course you could slice by user group, you could slice by school or what, whatever things you're interested in. So this is another interesting development where the, there's a new service that comes up that, that is designed to compete on analytics. Uh, so this is something, that, uh, something to look at that I'm, that I'm looking at. Uh, beyond electronic resource usage, the other area that of course nowadays we're interested in is in terms of physical usage. Uh, there's a lot of interest now in space analytics. In the past, all we looked at was the footfall, we counted the number of people who came in the library. Or if we were slightly more advanced, we, count, we used the tap-ins to measure how many people came to the library. But with the interest now in terms of design of space, we need more data beyond that. We need to know um, how many people are in a certain section. How long are they staying in, this, in that section? How often are people coming to certain sections? So because of this, uh, there's a lot of syst libraries are starting to work on space analytics. The one that's currently most famous is Measure the Future by Jason Griffey. So uh, the tagline for this is Google Analytics for Space for Libraries. Yeah, so it's a quite a compelling idea. Uh, in SMU, in uh, my institution, we already have similar systems. Uh, one system that we have is a collaboration with uh, SMU Live Labs. So this system uh, allows us to generate heat maps to tell us which areas are more occupied. It allows us to tell us how long people tend to stay in certain sections. It tells us how often people visit certain uh, visit the library. And even tells us, uh, it allows us to see the flow of traffic from one part of the campus building to another part of the campus building. So all this works using Wi-Fi uh, detection uh, systems. Uh, the other system that we have is a commercial system by Skywave. So this is, uh, this is employed in many shopping malls and basically it use, uses cameras to measure people moving in and out of certain areas. So again, uh, this is, I wouldn't say innovative now. I believe more and more libraries are moving towards this. Uh, uh, the other thing I will talk about beyond just using all these analytics for data-driven decisions is there's a trend, of course, re re in the last few years to, to uh, show value using library data. 
So one of the earlier studies that I, that I was aware of was by GIST, the Library Impact Data Study, where they correlated the, uh, uh, say, the number of e-resources accessed by students with the uh, course, with the degree class they obtained. So this was a very early correlation study. Uh, since then, there's been dozens of correlation studies done in the UK, the US, and of course, Australia. And, um, and a recent survey, uh, recent paper, uh, upcoming paper in the College and Research Libraries actually interviewed uh, provosts around uh, in the US. And they were, surprisingly to me, I've, they found that 72% 72, 72 of the provosts actually felt that correlations with student academic success would have a high influence on budget requests with them. So uh, they compared things like usage studies, uh, usage figures, satisfaction figures, and be, and, and all these measures, they felt that most of them felt that correlations with student academic success was what they really wanted to see uh, and would influence their decisions on budgets. So uh, this, this was quite an interesting result. Um, beyond all this, uh, now I'm going to talk about slightly more cutting edge things. Um, of course, right now, the idea is there's a lot of interest in machine learning. Uh, I'm not aware of many libraries that do a lot of machine learning. Uh, recently, I came across one of, a, one of the talks by Wayne State University that talked about using OCLC APIs uh, to predict, to try to do machine learning using TensorFlow. Uh, but the speaker also stressed that this was extremely experimental. So this is something that I think we'll, we'll see in the future, particularly when uh, analytics platforms like uh, IBM Watson are lowering the barriers to entry to machine learning. So this is something that uh, I think will come in the future. Uh, the other thing that again seems to be emerging is the interest in chatbots. Uh, chatbots are nothing new to libraries, I think. Libraries have tried on and off in the past 5-10 years without much success. Again, there's now a new attempt to do it again using the latest machine learning techniques. Uh, my colleague, Wee Hyung, uh, is actually uh, working on a chatbot uh, which integrates with Primo and Alma APIs. And uh, he's actually giving a talk at Igloo, uh, I think, next week. So I, know I won't steal his thunder to uh, talk more about this. And lastly, the area that uh, a lot of libraries are now looking at or universities are looking at is learning analytics. So this goes beyond just correlation studies, but, uh, but, work, but uh, focuses on the institution level. So for example, uh, library data can be used uh, together with say data from Blackboard to try to uh, create uh, interventions. So for example, you could predict in advance that a certain student uh, is requires more help. So again, uh, this is an area that libraries cannot go alone. So uh, this is something that's emerging. Uh, if you are interested in institutional learning analytics, uh, this, uh, you, can watch, uh, you can watch this webinar online uh, where this is being discussed. So this, this is an area, uh, of course, the other area that if you're interested, the other, uh, if you're also interested in learning analytics, uh, the, in the UK, GIST is also working on learning analytics. Okay, uh, so, uh, so that's all I have for today. So thank you very much for having me. Great, thank you so much, Aaron. Uh, does anyone have any questions they would like to ask? Go ahead and uh, use the chat if you do. I'll ask one while we're waiting. Uh, so I just was wondering what your perspectives are on what really the biggest challenges for libraries when they begin delving into analytics. Like is it um, getting staff trained or is it um, communicating value? What do you think is the biggest challenge? Um, I think the greatest challenge is that uh, it's unclear at um, I think one of, one of the greatest challenges is that you have to decide bef before you do, in, do into library analytics uh, what your goal is because uh, library analytics can be used in many ways. It can be used for operational decision making. It can be used to show value and uh, different stakeholders or different, uh, different stakeholders would have different interests and agendas. So uh, as a library analytics manager, uh, occasionally you'll be pulled in many different directions. Uh, different people will want different things. So uh, it's, it's important to be clear what the goal is. Yeah, so this is something that I've been learning uh, in the past year or two on this area. Uh, skills can be, can be, uh, can be learned, uh, resources can be obtained, but the goal itself is something that's tricky, particularly in an area like library analytics, which is pretty new uh, to most libraries. Yeah. 
Great, thank you. Uh, so we do have one question from the um, attendees. Uh, what's the best place to start upskilling uh, myself in this area? Uh, there are many possibilities. Uh, for me, I've been learning a mix of uh, learning general machine learning skills by uh, reading books on R, on Open Refine, uh, on Open Refine, on uh, Rapid Miner. And if you want more library related um, uh, things uh, or more academic related uh, material, uh, there's this website called uh, a Programming Historian. Uh, I love his tutorials. Uh, they cover everything from uh, how to do data mining, how to do data cleaning, how to use, uh, how to do, uh, how to query APIs. So a, a programming historian would be a good place to start because most of the case studies uh, that they, they use are actually very uh, authentic to librarians and people working in the academic, uh, academic fields. So uh, that would be one way to, one site that I would highly recommend. And as I mentioned before, uh, basically picking up any book on R or any website on R would be helpful, I would think. Yeah. Wonderful. If, uh, yeah. Thank you. I wrote those down myself. Um, so we just have a couple of questions here about um, the presentation being available or archived somewhere. Uh, we, were, we are currently recording the presentation and we'll make that available. And... Um, Aaron, do you use SlideShare as well? Um, uh, sure, yeah, you I can do. Maybe upload your slides there and, and we can share that with the attendees as well. Sure, I will do that. And a specific question actually, uh, where can we get hold of the GIST correlation study and learn analytics? Um, I think for the GIST correlation study, um, all you have to do is just Google GIST library impact data study. You'll get a, a blog post, a, a blog on uh, the, the project and you'll see links to publish uh, papers on that project. So that project ended about a couple of years ago. Uh, the one on learning analytics, uh, there's a GIST learning analytics website or project, and they have various things such as a code of conduct and, uh, and, uh, and the work that they've been doing. So all these data, uh, all these studies can be easily found on uh, the internet. Yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, so thank you so much, Aaron. Um, we'll start with the next presenter now. Uh, okay, so we have, next up, we have Susie Bailey, who is a resource discovery specialist at Griffith University. And today she'll be presenting on analytics for evaluating mark record services, easy proxy logs in Tableau. So Susie, great we can see your screen now. So if you wanna unmute yourself and, and go for it. Yes, we can. Um, okay. So about me, as Jesse said, I'm the resource discovery specialist. So I usually look after things like um, summon and web interfaces uh, and, the, and the classic library catalogue and not so much easy proxy logs. Um, so I've never looked, until I had to volunteer for this, never looked at an easy proxy log before. <laughs> and I've had two days of Tableau training and that's it. So I'm sure everybody's capable of doing what I'm going to talk about now. Um, quickly, before I start, a little bit about our architecture. Uh, basically, we, we pay additional money to get for some MARC record services, which we then import into our library management system, um, which is Triple Millennium. And then we export those from Millennium to our discovery layer. Um, Susie, are you able to um, turn up your uh, mic at all? I can just get closer. How's that sound? <laughs> Sorry, mix that up. Okay, that's as good as I can do. That's good. Great. Okay. Right. Uh, so, in addition to exporting our mark records into the, the discovery layer, we also then um, check those off in the knowledge base in Entoda, which determines what displays in Summon. So, as a result of that, we end up with um, duplicate records uh, in, in Summon. 
um, one of which we pay for and one of which is included in our summer subscription. So we were challenged by our um, acquisitions people, do we need both? Um, how are our users accessing Naxos? So we looked at the potential sources of data and the, the obvious choice was to look at the vendor statistics first. Um, but unfortunately, uh, Naxos does not provide referral information in their statistics, so we could not de decipher whether people were coming in through Summon or the catalog or Google or wherever else. So all that we could tell you was that basically um, there were, people were looking at an average of about six tracks per session, so per login. So um, we know that people are going into Naxos and then browsing once they get into Naxos. So next we looked at the summon statistics and what summon could tell us, but summon does not um, actually retain any information about electronic usage information. Um, so all we could see is how people were actually searching for music. And so we could see that um, whilst the majority of searches have no facet applied, people were generally using the music recording facet, um, which finds the records that are coming from our classic catalog. Uh, not very many people were using the streaming audio content type, which is um, the records coming from Summon. So next we look at our LibGuide statistics to see what we could find out. Um, and basically we could see that there was about 100 clicks through from LibGuides um, through to Naxos, which is about 20% of sessions coming through LibGuides. Um, but that wasn't enough for us to make a decision. So um, must I really look at easy proxy logs? I was trying to avoid it, but <laughs> we did. We decided to embark on that. So um, I must thank Beverly Reynolds, our easy proxy administrator, who um, helped with some of this task. She um, extracted some year-to-date lines from our easy proxy logs, which included the string Naxos music in, in the lines. Um, <clears throat> now, for those of you who actually look after easy proxy, I thought I would stress that um, by default, you don't actually get referral information in your easy proxy log. You need to make sure that you've modified your configuration files um, to include the referral information. Otherwise, you'll find that it may not be in your logs. Um, but basically, as Aaron said, every time a remote user uh, accesses a web page through easy proxy, you get a line in the log file. Uh, and if you look at one of the examples there that I've pointed out with the arrow, um, you can see that it's not just a line for the website that they access. You get a line for a lot of other things that that website pulls in. So if there's images on that website, you'll get a line for that. If it's pulling in JavaScript, you'll get a line for that. So analysing the logs is not as simple as just saying, oh, one line equals one a login, if you like. Um, there could be multiple lines in your transaction log that equate to the single session. So. Um, what we did was decided to pull them into Tableau to see if we could make some sense of, of things. So um, can I just get an indication how many people are, uh, have used Tableau by raising your hand? So it's about eight or so people, looks like. Okay, so, so as um, Aaron said, Tableau is a visualization tool that allows you to um, ingest multiple data sources. And depending on which version of Tableau you have, you can also produce online dashboards and share them with people. Um, so at the basic level, you can import uh, or ingest Excel and text files, um, but you can also set up um, automated ingestion through using APIs with your library management system, for example. Um, we have some, our um, IT service management tool that exports into a Google Doc and then the Google Doc um, automatically pulls into Tableau on a regular basis. So there's lots of automation that you can do with Tableau if you have, um, have it set up. But for the purposes of what I'm talking about today, I just use the free, free version, free trial download. Um, to do what I am going to talk about. So what I did was to import um, the text file from our easy proxy logs into Tableau, which was about 200,000 lines, and then run a filter to exclude the lines that were not 
directly retrieving items or works. So this kind of requires you, as, as um, Aaron alluded to, requires you to be familiar with the URL structure of the platform um, to understand what's actually in the logs and whether that equates to a download or somebody viewing a page or whether it's an irrelevant line that's just about an image that's being pulled in. Um, so all of the links that are in our library catalog point to either an item dot ASP page or a work.asp page. So that's why we put that filter in um, because we're only interested in looking at whether people are coming through our catalog or whether people are coming through some. Um, once you've got your data into Tableau, you can then create calculated fields to make sense of your data. So um, this might look a bit scary, but <laughs> basically what Tableau does is it takes your Excel file or your text file and turns it into a database, uh, like a relational database, and then you can then use um, SQL and, and other sort of programming logic to make sense of things. So this um, line here is basically just telling um, my chart, which you'll see at the end, to label things in a sensible way so that people know that bblearn.griffith.edu.au is actually learning at Griffith, our Blackboard um, learning, management, learning management system. Um, rather than just seeing the URL. Um, and then you get something pretty at the end, which looks like this. Uh, so I'll just go into Tableau so you can see that. So, I mean, this is just telling us um, how many, oops, I can't see it because it's so small. Um, Yes, yeah, so telling us how many sources are referring into Naxos. So basically what we can see is a lot of our data in our logs didn't actually have a referring source, so we don't know where people are coming from. Um, and that will always be the case with your logs. Sometimes the referrer might not be in. Um, and then the next biggest referrer is actually Naxos itself. So as I said before, we could tell that a lot of people were logging in directly to Naxos and then browsing within the, within the system. Um, Single sign-on was our next biggest referrer. Um, unfortunately, when people have to log in, we, we lose the original referring source, so we can't actually tell whether they were, where they were coming from. And then Summon and the library catalog were about on par um, in terms of usage. And then a very small percentage coming from Learning at Griffith and Google. Um, it's quite easy to sort of Play around with the data so you can drag things in and out um, quite easily if you want to change the view so you can just take things out if you like the table view and drag things in so if I wanted to see the actual source URLs I can just drag that field over to my table and it throws them all in there so you can actually see what they are if you want to so it's quite flexible um, and easy to sort of change your output and get a graphical, a graphical output if that's what you like. But you can also see um, a tabular format um, as well. So did we actually need both the mark records and the records from our knowledge base? Uh, the decision was no, we don't need them, at least not for discovery. So there are, um, I guess, other considerations such as you know what's in your library management system and whether you want everything that you've paid for in there and that sort of thing but certainly from a discovery perspective we decided uh, that we did not need both um, and that the records from the knowledge base were sufficient for our needs. Great, thanks Susie. Um, we did have a question from Alan. Can he says can you assume that none of the unknown Referrals are uh, easy proxy or classic catalog? Um, we can assume that they're not classic. Well, yes, we can assume that they're not classic catalog in that um, the referrer, there's no reason why the referrer wouldn't be in there for the classic catalog. Um, what do you mean by easy proxy itself? Oh, he meant summon. Summon, um, yeah. Um, I mean, it's possible that there are lines in there that did come from someone or the catalogue that just for some reason didn't capture the referrer, but it's 
it's all a bit, it's just sort of as good as you can get, I think is the, <laughs> the, the takeaway. So, I mean, it's nothing, it's not perfect. Um, and, and in the absence of not having any counter stats and not having anything else to make a decision on, it's better than nothing, um, but it's certainly not ideal. Great. And, okay. And another question. Um, what is your guess about the unknown blob? Unknown blob, yes. <laughs> I don't have a guess. Well, I, interestingly, none of the, um, none of the, so LibGuides didn't come through as a referrer for any of, so even though we know that there were clicks through from LibGuides to Naxos, LibGuides didn't come through as a referrer on any of the lines in that period that we analysed. So there, obviously there are some platforms um, that don't send referral information for, for whatever reason. So definitely LibGuides would have to be some of them. And uh, we have another question. Uh, does your e-resource traffic go through Easy Proxy, i.e. how to track traffic that does not come through Easy Proxy, like on campus use? Yeah, so at the moment, um, we've recently just switched, so all of our traffic on and off campus does go through Easy Proxy um, for 99.9% .9 of things. Um, if you don't track, so if you auto, yeah, so if you don't log in on campus, then that would be an issue, yeah. One uh, one more question from myself. I'm interested in Tableau. How did you find, I guess, learning Tableau? What, did you teach yourself or how did you go about learning it? Yeah. So I went to a two-day paid training course um, offered by Tableau themselves. Um, and then I taught myself. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, the training course itself didn't go into a lot of specifics about actual data ingestion and didn't go into specifics about some of the more complex um, clauses that you can put in. It was more about the actual visualisation side and creating charts. And because the data that I'm looking at, it doesn't lend itself well to necessarily a, a bar chart. <laughs> it wasn't so useful, but certainly if you're looking at um, financial data, profit and loss statistics, all those sorts of things, which the, a lot of the training was focused around, you know, that sort of um, financials of a, of a business side of things, then um, the training was very useful in terms of giving you an idea of how you can visualise the data. And certainly that when you're playing around with visualising the data, that can sort of give you a different insight. But in terms of the actual ingestion process and calculated fields um, that was yeah, googling and teaching myself and I found it quite easy so although the, the work that I did in Tableau you could easily do in Excel um, I found Tableau much easier uh, and less less repetitious um, in terms of the process once I'd figured it out good, good to know thank you all right um, if there's no last questions for Susie uh, we'll Thank you very much. And um, we'll jump on to the next present presenter. So next up is uh, Sally Donnelly, who's a team leader of acquisitions and metadata services at Southern Cross University. And Sally is going to be presenting on um, revisiting analytics for long-term trend analysis. So Sally, if you want to go ahead and start sharing your screen. Great, we can see that. Everyone can see that. Can you hear me? We can. Um, is everybody okay with that audio level? Yep. Okay. All right, you're good to go. Okay then. Hi, I'm Sally Donnelly. I'm team leader of Discovery and System Services at Southern Cross University. We're in Lismore at the Northern New South Wales, at the campus of where I am. Um, I'm just going to talk about the usage, revisiting some of the um, analyses that we've done over time and the, it's becoming very 
a much better system if we can just we keep it starting to keep and to reuse a lot of analyses, which is proving quite helpful in planning. Um, um, now, I know there are some people out here that um, don't use Alma. Our system, library management system, is Alma, so we're using design analytics that comes with the package of Alma from Ex Libris. Now, some of my um, visuals will be from containing data from Alma, but it's not actually specifically an Alma um, tool. So it shouldn't be too confusing for people that don't use Alma. So what I've today is that our librarians here, our liaison librarians, um, have access to the design analytics and have been provided with some basic training, but because of um, their busy lives, they're in and out of the library a lot, moving around through the schools and everything, they don't have time to, to, to make that definite time where they can sit down and do a lot of work that's required with the analytics to start getting, producing some of the um, results that they require. So as a recall, our discovery and system services team do a lot of the majority of the um, analytics searches and produce um, tables and whatever else that they need for any of their work. Um, previous to uh, getting ourselves more organised, if we did um, analysis or something like that, we'd often file it away into our own personal drive on a computer or half save it into a part of analytics, but no one else, we didn't just, you know, regularly share the information or the actual search with other people within the library. So what we've found is that we've started to set up a little system, save things and to go back and to reuse them and they're becoming quite helpful. So what we did when we went from Alma to, Aleph to Alma, um, we started and we started to do some more work with analytics and to create a lot more um, processes for people. We created a dashboard for the liaison librarians to provide them with their current information and exp on the expenditure of monographs. So it started with the current information and then we've gone backwards to add... What is it? <laughs> um, sorry. We've... Um, so that we can um, provide them with their up-to-date information and expenditure in their specific subject area. And they're able just to get into that. They can just sign in and have a look at it at any time. It's a live system so that they can see at all times where they are with their monograph expenditure. So this is just the first part of what they can see. It's part of for the business and tourism monographs. So they can see straight up, they've got the visual of their overall um, expenditure and how it's going. And then we've separated it by monthly purchases. So they can go through, they can easily see the cost, the titles, publisher. And on the right hand side, this is starting in obviously January, 2017. The next page is that we move down is that we've now added patron driven acquisitions to their selection monthly list. So they can easily see now what has been selected through the traditional format of requests or through our UCMS textbook list and then titles that have been picked up through the patron driven acquisition. Um, so we've now been using this dashboard since 2015, which is when we went over to Alma. So it's able to provide them with a lot of the background information um, immediately rather than us having to go back to an analysis that we did and then change the dates to go backwards or forwards and to rerun the analysis. So it's taking a lot our preparation to provide information. In this case, it's automatic, but it's a lot less time than what it used to take. And we can provide our complete ALMA history to the liaisons or to library management pretty well straight away. So this is an example of when we, where we save the files in the Alma Analytics. So we can all go, go back to 2015 and 16 and then we'll add 17 to it. So just straight up, we can go back into a past analysis and um, use it when we need to. The other example that I just quickly wanted to talk about is 
where we've used an old analysis more often is through our PDA purchase. We've collected a select group from our original PDA trial and we've just redo the analysis at various times. So to start it off, we did the time the PDA ran in 2016, any, we kept all the PDA titles separately and then any other purchases of eBooks at the same time that were done through tradition, more, more traditional formats, we just kept rerunning the comparison over a time. We ran it from three months, then again at six monthly after the DDA finished. And it's, so it's always these set titles with the set usage and the cost. So very surprisingly, we found that um, DDA titles have received consistently higher usage than our normally acquired titles. And for some reason, they were significantly less expensive DDA titles. So it's been proven, well, for us, the trend is that they're far more popular with our students than the traditionally ordered materials. Um, so we were able to use this to make help in manage library management to make a decision to use the DDA as a just a regular part of ordering ebooks, and then it just runs in the background all the time, and titles are just once they're used by the students are automatically purchased. Um, so that proved particularly helpful. So. What we had to look back in conclusion was that we needed a, a proper naming convention so that not only could we remember what we were looking for, but also to our other colleagues that might want to have a look at the um, analysis. And even though it hasn't been a policy of S Southern Cross at the moment, we don't share any of that, our um, analyses and we haven't put them onto a shared drive in Alma to share them with the Alma world. Um, but it's been really good. So if we're going to go with, in hindsight, we look at it, if we, you know, we're going to the effort of developing a useful analysis, you know, we really recommend that you consider archiving and making the um, previous analyses, you know, much more easily discoverable for your other colleagues. So I think that's about it. So thank you. For listening. Thank you, Sally. Uh, any questions at all for Sally? I have one. Um, so, with your Alma analytics reports that you've created, are they gener general or generic enough for you to put them in the uh, Alma, I guess, shared analytics folders for maybe other institutions to run if they want? There's probably some there that we could have a look at. Um, we just have to look at them and then we could put them into the um, shared drive. We just have to discuss it with the team, so to speak. Great. I think that might be really good. Some yeah. people, yeah, because it would just replicate the other institutions data there instead, but that might be quite helpful. Um, okay, so we do have a couple of questions coming through. Was, um, was this report template created by you or is it standard? Like an out of the box one. No, it was um, we okay. created it. Um, we have a couple of people in the team. Our manager Alexander Sussman, um, Bronwyn Coleman, who's in the team, and myself. And we've just at various times we either work together, we work separately to come up with these. Um, most of them, it's something that we've started it from scratch with. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of the out of the box ones are generally too um, general, I find. Yeah. But a lot of this we started from was we did a review of our um, purchasing with the liaisons and their subscriptions once we went over to Alma. We reviewed, you know, why we keep all those statistics, how we were doing it, and it, this was just, you know, a result of it was this dashboard that came out of it. Uh, it's well worth it. Mm. Okay, we have another question from the attendees. Do you have a staff member to manage all area of analytics in the library or does each area run their own analytics as needed? Yeah, pretty much each area runs their own analytics. From Alma. Yep. 
Mm. Great. Okay. I think there's one last question, but I think that one is for the end of or close to the end of the session, maybe for all panelists. So might hold off on that one for now. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks, Sally. Thank you. Okay, so next up we have Kathy Slaven, uh, who is the Information Access Coordinator at QUT, and she will be presenting on uh, using search term analytics to tweak library database discovery for students. So, Kathy, if you want to go ahead and start sharing. Okay, will do. Thank you. Okay, that should be starting to share. I'm assuming people can hear me and see my screen. We can see your um, presenter's view. Okay, sorry. Let's see if I can. Bear with me. Still see it now? Present a view, yeah. Yeah, yeah, can't get out of it. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Aha, uh -huh. no? Better. That's better? Yep. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so today um, I'm sort of talking about the other end of the scale. I'm talking about how at QUT Library we've done some really simple search term analytics in order to help students um, find li library databases. Um, and this is a case study from last year based on how we made some changes to the library um, homepage. So this is how we use search terms to basically sort of help identify any issues that, um, that we saw students having, helped identify the behaviour of students around database discovery and enabled us to implement some really small but hopefully significant changes that helped uh, the user experience. A bit of background, um, each year since 2013, we've run a Loop 11 evaluation, which is an online usability uh, tool. And what we do is we track students using the library website, and then we ask them about three or four questions, such as what were they searching for? What did they use? So we could see what terminology they were using. And then we ask them what issues they experienced for their search. Um, and we did path analysis and what this highlighted for us was that a lot of students would just search summon on our homepage exclusively, they'd ignore everything else, even if there were databases that were much more suitable for their tasks and then they'd just kind of give up and say, I couldn't find what I was looking for. So what we decided to do was we tried an experiment. Um, we removed the term databases from the homepage and replaced it with search tools. Uh, the reasoning for this was because we already knew uh, that databases was confusing for some students, especially newer students or inexperienced library users. And we wanted to see if removing this terminology uh, would remove uh, a barrier for students but not hinder the, the more experienced library users. Uh, we weren't necessarily convinced this would be successful, but we did want to persevere for a couple of months to see what the behaviour was around it from students and staff. And um, we'd also previously had um, independent usability consultants we'd worked with suggest a similar thing, so we thought we'd give it a try. Um, we picked the term search tools because we'd been using that in Loop 11 um, for a number of years and it appeared to nicely encompass things from summon to databases to the catalogue. So back at the beginning of last year, we'd actually only used the term database once on the homepage and that was towards the bottom. Um, you can see at the bottom there, search A to Z list was one of the, the heavily used links on the homepage uh, behind the law, health and business links and the there by study area links, there were database page links. And of course the summon search box had uh, quite massive usage. Um, and then, so what we did is we moved the search A to Z list up the page so it was more easily um, sort of findable and we changed the by study area to search tools by study area. And we just wanted to see what happened. 
Um, the initial feedback we got, there was from some noise from academics and library staff, um, not a lot of direct feedback from students initially, uh, but then we, as part of our evaluation, you know, we were getting, we were looking at feedback as well as looking at other analytics and one of the ones we were looking at was search terms um, and we were using Google Analytics at this stage because uh, someone hadn't uh, released their uh, OBI analytics tool at that point in time. But looking at our, the search terms within Summon, that told us a bit more of a story. So we started to notice a number of searches appearing for library databases. And um, you can see from the question marks there, I'd say there was a little bit of frustration that people couldn't find it on the website. Um, we started seeing searches like find databases, QT databases. We, these weren't, hadn't previously been in our Summon search logs. And I mean, there was always data, the term, people always search for databases, but this increased as well. So what we did at this point, and yeah, the obvious move would have been to add databases back to the home page, but we did actually want to see if this was just an initial reaction to the change. Um, so what we did is we already had a databases best bet in Summon. So if someone searched for databases, a link would appear. Uh, we modified that um, to sort of explain how to find databases on the home page. It was actually, the screenshot here is, is not the screenshot that it would have been at the time. But what we did is we went into Google Analytics search term and looked at the terms that people were entering to find databases. So now if they were frustrated and couldn't find it and they entered something into our search box, they would actually be directed to um, where to find database pages. So for example, here, if they'd search QT databases, they wouldn't be left at a dead end. They would find what they, what they wanted or they'd be able to get where they wanted. A few months later, we did do a follow up a uh, Luke 11 evaluation and overall, there weren't many comments, but those that were negative were from experienced library users and those that were positive were pretty much from first and second year students. It was quite amazing the difference between those that didn't like it and those that did. But again, overall, there weren't that many comments. So as a result, um, we updated the terminology on the website to include both. So databases and specialised search tools. We added some explanatory text. And what we did then was started again to look at Google Analytics search terms that were coming through for, for Summon. And we certainly saw a complete drop in the number of people searching for library databases and databases and find databases. Um, we've also just completed another Loop 11 just a couple of weeks ago. And overall, I think our experiment of trying to change the wording um, around databases didn't necessarily draw more usage to that section of the website. But it did, you know, we're hoping it kind of makes it a little bit more user friendly for both experienced and, and new students. But what we found was the most interesting part of this process was as we looked more and more into our Google Analytics search terms, particularly for Summon, we noticed just how many students were using Summon as their main access point for databases, but particular individual databases. We realised previously that students were using it, but we didn't realise just how much. Um, and this turned out to be quite problematic because around the same time we were making the changes, we had also implemented the new LibGuides A to Z database list. And these records were, were not actually available in Summon. So any students searching Summon for a database name, they, they weren't getting anywhere. They were finding nothing. We initially wrongly assumed this wasn't an issue because the new A to Z list, uh, the search there was just so much better than what we previously had. We just assumed people would go there to search. Um, but not the case. So what we did then very quickly was we did a bulk import of all of our database records as best bets into Summon. Um, but the next step was we went into Google Analytics, looked at all the search terms, particularly for the, we didn't do it for every single database, we did it for our really popular ones. And we looked at what the search terms students were using. And you can see here in this example, um, so Sci Global Australian Standards, that's a pretty popular database. Um, for us at least anyway, I'm sure it's for lots of people. You can see the different combinations of search terms that students were using. Um, so what we did, and quite a, quite a range of combinations there. So we went in to summon, edited the best bet and made sure we added tags that matched the different ways that students were searching for Cyglobal. So of course now if they search Standards Australia or any combination thereof, they weren't left at a dead end. As a follow up, um, we continued to monitor our sum and search terms in Google Analytics and we could see that uh, students or, or staff were successfully connecting to databases and we sort of kept monitoring the search terms they were using and adding new tags as we need to. What we did find overall was that the best bets 
that were based on the analytics tags were significantly better for database discovery uh, compared to just harvesting records or adding having records in, in some. And, um, and this really was because we could really narrow down what students were using. Um, so we thought, okay, this is working well. We also repeated this process for our database A to Z search as well. And so what we did here is we reviewed our LibGuide search statistics um, to identify database search terms. And what it really highlighted was how many times people misspell database names. Um, and so we went through and for key or popular databases, we added these you know, misspelled names to the alternative or keyword field. So in this example, this is the example for EBSCO. So in our database list, this is all the different ways that people search for or spell or attempt to spell EBSCO or EBSCO host databases. So we could tell from that a lot of students wouldn't have been finding what they were looking for. So for a lot of these, we then went to the database record for EBSCO and we added the alternative names or keywords. So if they then search, for example, EBSCO, which seemed to be a common one, um, into our database pages, then they would actually find the record they were looking for and hopefully learn how it's spelled. We then um, made sure the same tags were also in Summon because we knew that they were searching Summon as well. I mean, ideally we wouldn't like to have to duplicate all of this effort, but what we're doing is we're, we're working within the constraints of the systems that we have, but we felt even though there was a lot of manual editing, uh, we thought it was worth it because it really did help students connect to the databases um, that they needed. What we found also when we were looking through our LibGuide searches is that, um, you know, students were searching for so much more than just database names. And, and we already knew this, but um, it was quite amazing to see how much they were searching for information on a topic or particular books, or in a lot of cases, unit codes or course codes and readings. Um, so what we did with this information, we went, okay, well, we use this to customise um, our zero results error message page. So students now, if they just entered something like tobacco smoking into the database list, we did have a custom message that said, yep, nothing found, but if you're looking for articles or books, try here. If you're looking for unit readings, go to QUT readings. Um, there is actually a character limit there, so we would like to have done a bit more, but we couldn't fit that many characters in. So this is just a very quick uh, and straightforward case study. But overall, what we've learned is that you can just access really simple analytics, um, you know, do stuff day to day, that's a really effective way to help identify pain points for our students. Um, we certainly do get comments from students about finding databases. And so this kind of helped us come up with uh, solutions to improve the user experience. And it didn't require any, anything more than just access to your analytics tools and to statistics and actually taking the time um, to look at them. So we, you know, it's nothing too fancy, but it, it did work for us. So thank you, I think that's all. Wonderful. Thanks, Kathy. Um, please go ahead and um, type in any questions you have for Kathy. We do have some feedback already saying, I never thought of including typos in my best bets. So good thinking. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah. um, were you using Google Analytics Search Console, Console to check search terms through Google Search? We were using Google Analytics um, so we'd set up profiles for Summon and within the under the behaviour tab, there's something for search terms. So that's what we were, we set up a profile there. I'm not sure if that answers the question. I'm not quite sure. All right. Um, I have a question. Oh, were you able to tell after you added all those new tags to your best bets in Summon, were you able to tell whether the best bets were um, like the click rate went up or um, the number of people using best bets went up? No, I don't think we could. It's really hard to get usage on actual best bets from within Summon. But what we could, and I'm pretty, sure, I'm pretty sure I've looked at this, I can't recall off the top of my head, but we couldn't track number of clicks on best bets. But what we could do is we could see the search terms and go, and then we'd, sometimes we'd just replicate the search and go, yep, that worked. Yep. Um, it's, it's quite manual, but um, but it does actually really help students. Because mm -hmm. uh, Primo's just released a similar feature now, the resource recommender. So there's possibly um, a few attendees that 
you know, this would really help them thinking uh-huh. about how they might, might set that up as well. Yeah, it does work really well. Uh, a question from Susie. Does LibGuides A to Z record search terms, record search terms, or do you have a GA over the top, a Google Analytics over the top? We do both, but the LibGuides do do search terms. Um, like the LibGuides statistics module, you can get search terms. It's across the entire LibGuides platform, but you can limit it to A to Z, I thought. Um, but we also do Google Analytics um, as well. All right. No other questions? Fantastic then. Thank you so much, Cathy. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, all right. We'll head on to our, our um, second last speaker. Hopefully we have enough time for our last. But um, next up we have Adam Atkinson, uh, who is a re- Information Resource Officer at the University of Queensland. And Adam's going to be talking about managing counter usage data and sushi harvesting um, in Alma plus JUSP. So, thanks. all right, thanks. We can see your screen. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Okay, um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about how we uh, manage and uh, access our counter data. Uh, give you a bit of a background of how we move from just in case provision of counter data to just in time delivery. Um, we've done that by uh, using Alma's counter capabilities and we've also had adjustment to the mix. So I'll talk a little bit about how we're using both of those together and then I'll, I'll finish off with the obvious question as to why we're using both and they do depend each other in a few different areas. Um, just as background, we used to provide counter data for our librarians uh, on a just-in-case basis. We downloaded everything from every vendor, uh, stored it locally, uh, you can see there we developed a data set of some two gigs worth, uh, 11,700 files across 2,700 folders. Uh, you know, they covered 240 vendors. Uh, not all of them were counter compliant. And we were doing this every six months. Uh, that was taking about 60 hours each time we did a full download. Uh, so it's obviously not a very sustainable practice. And uh, the reasons for uh, making all that data available so that our librarians could have that data to make uh, purchasing and cancellation decisions. Um, they didn't tend to access that data very frequently. Uh, the other reason we had it available was so that we could uh, use it for marketing and outreach purposes to demonstrate how well those uh, resources were being used. So we couldn't continue doing that same sort of just in case approach, certainly couldn't stop it completely, which is why we started using Alma's capabilities. We'd always wanted to move to sushi harvesting, and Alma's recently made that possible for us. Uh, we signed up with Alma Primo in 2016. At that time, Ex Libris was facing new stat out, and this year has made uh, sushi harvesting and counter data storage a part of. The Alma platform. So we jumped in early as part of the early adopters, did a bit, little bit of testing towards the end. Um, what we did was up, we uploaded manually all of our existing historical data for the report types that are available from launch, which is uh, the basic journal reports and book reports, um, and then set about setting up our sushi harvesting, which you can see here for each vendor that you've got set up in Alma, you can set up a sushi uh, account for each report type that you need and set it to harvest. Uh, we have it harvesting every week and basically it looks for gaps in our data and fills them if it can. And it does require a fair bit of manual intervention. You've got to set up each uh, sushi account for each report manually. You can duplicate it, of course, but you still got to make sure you do each one for each report that you need. And there's also a little bit of um, interaction required with Ex Libris and our vendors to make sure that the XML requests going out are accurate. Uh, just a simple missing character can make the report fail. And to make sure that the XML uh, response coming back is also accurate. Uh, once that's all harvested, it's um, 
sent to Alma Analytics for us where we can do all sorts of um, analysis, fairly complex analysis, and that was one of the selling points for us for going to Alma so that we could use the Alma Analytics product. And we've not had many problems. It's all been quite smooth um, setting up this sushi process and just a few little tweaks here and there to make sure each vendor is working correctly. And we, we've added into the mix recently, um, we've signed up for the Just service, uh, service, which is the Journal Usage Statistics portal. And basically it is a third party service that will um, do all your sushi, sushi harvesting for you. Uh, what it does differently uh, to Alma is there's less uh, manual intervention from us. Uh, there's not going to be a vendor sitting here harvesting data unless just know that no, so it works properly. Um, they uh, liaise with the vendors, they make sure the data is correct, they do lots of quality control checking for us. Um, and then they then uh, provide it to us in various um, charts and data displays, dashboards. I was going to do a quick live demo, but I think we're short on time. Um, Just move it as to why we're doing both of them together because they both are sushi harvesting services. Um, the benefit, well, we do want them to talk to each other because we want to do complex analyses in our analytics. Um, so we have set up sushi harvesting accounts for each of the reports that just harvest in our so that we can pull that data in. It's a case of um, making an inactive any duplicated accounts and just letting them just talk down. And that's been a smooth pro uh, process. Uh, it all works correctly. We're very happy with that. Um, to look at the reasons why we might do both, just is a very user friendly product. It gives us simple answers. Um, it's very easy to use. You, you don't require any level of expertise to just get in and ask a simple question, get your answers and get out. Analytic, Amara Analytics is much more powerful and you can do far more complex things with it. So we definitely want to keep using that. But it does require a, a quite a lot more expect, expertise to uh, use. So we like to see just as our, our quick and easy answers and algorithms where we will uh, do more detailed analysis. Um, Using both together gives us broader benchmarking. Uh, Alma Analytics has benchmarking, but of course it's limited to uh, Alma users and they have to opt in to make the data available. Uh, just gives us access to more users regardless of whatever library platform they might be using. Um, an exciting selling point for Just is that we are anticipating that it will make our core reporting simpler. Um, part of what they did in the UK where they started was to um, assist in the sconal returns. So we're hoping and anticipating that our usage data and probably what our electronic holdings might be provided directly to call from just. Um, and the, the final uh, benefit that we see of having both is that just is actively uh, doing quality checks on our data. Uh, and it doesn't do that and that's fine. It's a self-service service. Um, the other benefit that Just offers us is that they sue vendors to get them on board as sushi providers. And we said that's a big benefit. We'd rather have all of our data coming via sushi and all of our usage data being counter. So that is basically where we're at. Um, it's a quick summary. I'm quite happy with both products and we see them working together very well. So that's about it from me. Thank you. Great, thank you, Aaron. I mean, Adam. Um, so does anyone have any questions for Adam at all? Uh, I just, I think you've kind of answered maybe a lot of people's questions on your why both screen. Uh, very interesting to see uh, your comment about making call reporting simpler and um, the benchmarking um, point is very interesting as well. Got some questions. 
We were told that sushi could not be harvested by more than one service and we would need to remove the just compliance vendor's sushi from Alma. Is that not the case? Oh, look, it kind of is the case. You can't have both running at once. So basically, we'd set up Springer in Alma Harvest, we've made that one inactive and created a just sushi harvest account. So no, you can't have two services. Try to have both working at the same time in Alma. Okay. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so, yes. And another question, if a vendor doesn't have a sushi option, do you manually download the reports? We did. Um, we're not currently uploading anything into Alma anymore, but we've, we've, we've uploaded a historical data set and we're just going to leave it at that. And from here on in, as demand for the library requires a particular uh, counter report that can only be added manually, then we'll do it. Great. And another question, do you have any of your analytics reports available in the Alma Analytics shared folders? Uh, not currently for counter. Um, I'm sure we could put some there in the future. Great. Maybe um, on the very last slide, I'll um, have your contact details up again. And then if yeah, anyone wants to get in touch with you about what they would like to see in there, maybe um, that's a good way to do it. Yeah, no problem. Uh, okay, some more questions. Can you download stats from just to upload to Alma or do you have to go to the vendor site? I, you can download your reports as um, CSV files. I haven't actually tested whether you can then upload them successfully, but I assume you should be able to because they'll be downloaded in counter format. So you should be able to do that. But I would test that first. Mm -hmm. And uh, what do you do with non-counter data? Would you put it into Alma ever? No, we would not put it into <laughs> Alma at all. That, that's why we're happy to get on board with Sushi to, uh, oh, sorry, with Just so that they can push our non-counter compliant vendors in the right direction. We'd, love, we'd prefer to only deal with counter stats. Great, that might be it. Thank you, Adam, um, that was great. Okay, so we do have uh, one last presentation and that is um, actually has been pre-recorded. So the presenter is uh, Peter Hopkins, who's the, who's the manager of digital library services at Bond. Um, he's actually, she couldn't be here today, but she pre-recorded her session and it does go for 10 minutes. So we will um, just, go over time just a slight uh, little bit, but hopefully you can all stick around for that. Uh, so I'll just start sharing the screen now where her, and get her recording up. Oh, and she's, um, yeah, her presentation is on, I guess the call statistics dashboard that we created in Alma here at Bond and how that helped us. Okay, so uh, let me know if the sound is um, okay for you as well when I start sharing. Hello everyone, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our call statistics dashboard that we have set up in Alma Analytics. I know some of the attendees at this webinar are not from academic libraries, so a little bit of background about the call statistics. It comes around every year. The Council of Australian University Libraries has been collecting statistics uh, from member sites since 1953. Since 2005, these statistics have been available online and their purpose is for benchmarking and for comparison. So it's important that the definitions are interpreted consistently across the members. Libraries, however, have to figure out how to generate those numbers from various systems and often in the past, some had very limited reporting functionality that was difficult to use. So those little conversation bubbles on the side of the screen of the slide there really um, illustrate what the experience was like for us at Bond with our previous system, where we would run a report, copy the SQL into an email that we sent <laughs> to the person requesting it so that next year we could look it up and see how, we, how did we run it last time. In 2015, we migrated from our previous system into Alma. 
and there were some key things that we wanted to get out of the new system. So we really wanted to reduce the time spent extracting statistics. We really wanted to minimise manual statistics recording. We wanted increased consistency of reporting from year to year and to see what we had reported in previous years easily without requiring someone to log into the call website. We wanted visibility at any time so that there was no need to ask someone for a report to be run. And we wanted to be able to reuse selected reports or analyses as they're known in, um, in Alma Analytics um, across other dashboards. Um, in our previous system, recording the ULAN statistics, which is the um, reciprocal borrowing agreement between academic libraries in Australia and New Zealand, that had been very painful for us in the previous system as we had no obvious place to capture institutional affiliations, nor whether they were staff or students. The available reporting tools were not flexible enough and while they could be customised, it was just as easy to keep copies of SQL statements and run them at the right time of the year. But even that didn't help with these ULAN statistics, um, which then meant that someone had to spend a day and a half looking at the paper forms that people had filled in when they registered as reciprocal borrowers. We set up statistical categories in ALMA to capture the home institution and the user type. So whether they were staff or undergraduate or postgraduate. And then we had to focus on data quality processes to ensure that the categories were correctly captured when reciprocal borrowers registered. Alma Analytics offers widgets that can be added to the home screen. And we set up some, of, some analyses to highlight problem records and display them in these widgets or in a report. So in that first image, you can see the one with the two red dots on it. The red dots indicate that that particular record is missing the user type and the um, home institution categories. And we could also see um, the, whether the expiry dates were recorded as the 28th of February. The um, arrangement is that when someone registers for this program that they're um, eligible to borrow until 28th of February each year. In the bottom illustration, you can see there another analysis that we had set up and this one was where the statistical category had been captured correctly but the user group had been um, entered incorrectly. So we had different ways of approaching this and looking, identifying the records that we had to follow up on. So another option, and this is the one that we're currently using, um, is the email report and these can be scheduled to um, to run and then be emailed to the appropriate person who will be actioning them. And in this one, um, you can see that same kind of information. It shows the user type, the home institution and the expiry date. So the person who receives this report then has to review this once a week and go back and edit any of the records that are missing that information. Let's take a look at the dashboard itself. So what you can see at the moment is the um, current interface when I log into Alma. In the next couple of weeks, a new user interface will be available, so it will look a little bit different to this down the track. On this home page, I've got some widgets turned on. So the widget that I mentioned for the data quality processes could have been displayed in one of these sorts of boxes on the page. The dashboard is accessible from the analytics menu at the top of the screen and this is the particular one that we're referring to. Now you can see that the dashboard has pages for the different types of data that we want to pull all together. So the one we're looking at at the moment is the total loans and renewals and I can choose which year I want to report for. So if I'm interested in this year or last year, I just select it from there and apply that. And the um, system goes away and brings back the reports. We have found it useful to make sure that our filters are displayed within the page because that makes it much easier for people to understand what is going on with the actual report and what it's defining and what things we may have excluded from some of them as well. If I go and have a look at the ULANS one, since we've been talking about that a little bit, you can see at the top I've got um, a report that gives us the total number of loans for a particular year. Once again, it's, I can go and choose 
the relevant year to report on so I can go back and look at previous years. And at the bottom of this page we have the total number of loans and renewals by institution. So I can easily go and have a look and see that um, the Sunshine, Southern Cross University rather, which is a near neighbour of ours, we have rather a lot of their, um, quite a number of loans from that particular institution in this set. And you can see in this one, we've put in a filter here that it doesn't include this particular primary identifier. That's because that is the barcode of a testing account. So we didn't want to muddy our reports by that. So that's why I mean by it's helpful to have the filters displaying on the page. So other sorts of things that we have in here, um, counts of how many we have in the reciprocal borrowers or community users and alumni who have registered to use the library we can look at non-serial items and titles and in this one we get to choose a date from when the item was received so I will just make that January 2018 so apply that so this one is now reporting on the total number of items and titles that were received before the 1st of January 2018 so we have 97,775 titles and 112,890 items. So the other pages here are fairly similar, but they're looking at um, items acquired, items withdrawn, and then the final page is our document delivery one. So we're using Alma resource sharing functionality integrated with Libraries Australia document delivery. Once again, we've got some partner names which are excluded and these were also involved with testing. So we didn't want to count those in the statistics. So these are the items that we have borrowed from other libraries and these are the statistics for items we have loaned to other libraries. We may do some work in the future to add some more visual sort of um, displays into this dashboard and just to give you an idea of what's possible we'll have a look at one of our other ones where we have some three-year comparisons of loans and renewals set up and we can add these sorts of graphs and charts into them there is also another one which has um, a pie chart in it so that gives you a bit of an idea of the sorts of things that we have available to us in the dashboards So the question then is, did we get what we wanted? Once the reports and dashboard were set up, they're ready to go whenever needed. There's no more reviewing paper registration forms. Um, the data quality checking takes very little time. So that's a, um, a reasonable exchange in the amount of effort that was gone into for the ULANS um, statistics in the past. We know that the numbers are generated the same way each year, so we have improved consistency. You can see that we had previous years visible. We have visibility for staff based on their roles in ALMA. We can assign them access to look at any of the dashboards and we can reuse those reports or analyses across different dashboards if we wish to. Any other ALMA customers who are interested in having a look at our um, dashboard and the reports that it uses to see if it will help them are most welcome to have a look at the um, copies we have put in the community zone in ALMA analytics. It's under our Bond University folder in the institution section. You will need both the dashboard and the reports folders. The dashboard makes use of the individual reports and they're linked up. I haven't tested copying the whole lot and seeing if um, the report, the dashboard and reports all link up, but you're most welcome to go and have a look, try that out and see if that will be useful for you. I'd also like to say a thank you to UNSW who back in 2015 shared uh, a few of their um, call statistical um, analyses. Um, so a very big thank you to them. And that's it from me and a very big thank you to you all for listening. All right, I'll just um, share the last slide. Okay.
All right, so we've reached the uh, end of our lightning talks. Uh, so thank you to all the presenters uh, for sharing uh, their case studies. I think it really highlights, I guess, the range of different things happening in the institutions in regards to library analytics. And a big thank you to Aaron Tay for sharing his knowledge and insight into this growing trend. So we hope these presentations have provided some food for thought um, for you on what you could do in your institution. So I've put up on the screen here the contact details of our presenters today in case you have any further questions. And of course, since Peter was not available to answer any questions today, um, please feel free to uh, get in contact with her. And so on behalf of the QLOC ICT Working Party, I'd like to thank you all for attending today and um, goodbye. Thank you.